Please be seated. Good morning. I need to get that over here. So just go and mingle for a moment, all right? Just go and see somebody just quick. We'll get organised. Things I do, honestly. Thanks. Don't fall off the stage, will you? That's fine. Right, good morning. It's great to be here. It's a privilege to preach the Word of God. And um, as you know, I'm quite visual, so I'm surrounded by input for your eyes, not only your ears. Today's message is called Your Created, Created Identity. The word create means to make or cause something to become, to bring something into existence. So when you became a Christian, God took you from a place of sin and death and you became a Christian, washed in the blood. Hallelujah, right? Your identity is your distinct personality, your individual characteristics by whom you are known. Because I am known for my shy, introvert nature. <laughs> That's part of my, my identity, my character. So, I'll do that first, and then we'll look at adoption through Christ, and then the last one on my chart here, we facts first is feeling, something which uh, we all have to get through every day. So I'm looking at first creating identity. I want to start back in Genesis when, when the Lord created the universe, the cosmos. I love that phrase, out of the chaos, God made the cosmos. I want to read you Psalm 19, the first six verses. I think most of us will know these words. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth. Their word to the ends of the world. In the heavens God has pitched a tent for the sun. And is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber. Like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of its wall. How great is our God, how he made the universe. The, the cosmos declares the glory of God. It, it, his creation from the smallest flower to the biggest nebula just tells us Words with no sound that there is a creator. God has created all these things. Romans 1, 20 says, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. When people deny a creator God, they are denying all this stuff which is absolutely incredible. How, how the universe is held so lovely together. And it saddens me that on many TV programmes, like people like Brian Cox, they talk about the wonders of the universe, how amazing it is, and yet they never give God any credit. But, um, However, Brian Cox said this, and I quote, now, that is from an atheist, right? The guy that does all this stuff. He says these words. The solar system is driven by rhythm so regular that the whole thing can be run by clockwork. It seems extraordinary that such a well-ordered system could have come into being spontaneously, but it is in fact 
a great example of the beauty and the symmetry that lies at the heart of the universe. So even that man realises something there. Of course, God in Genesis 1.31 said this, God saw all that he had made and it was very good. And it was evening and morning of the sixth day. I just want to pick up on one thing about God's creation, just to give you an idea how he created. Right, I'm going to talk about the moon going round the earth, right? The moon, I thought you all know this, goes round the earth in 29 days, 12 hours, 44 minutes and 3 seconds. It never alters from that, even the 3 seconds, right? And also, what's amazing, we only see the one side of the moon, don't we? So the moon somehow moves, so we only see that face to give us the, the moonlight that we need at night time. And God has designed that, so every month to the second, the moon goes round the earth accurately, year after year after year. God is so finite in his detail, so beautiful in, in what he has made. So I don't want to talk about his finest creation, and that's you and me. Do you realise that you are all made in God's image? When you look at each other, we should see that, that God has made you, and we are, we are all beautiful. And again from Psalm, this is one of my favourite texts. For you, that's God, creating my innermost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. You were created in your mother's womb, a miracle. And God knows you, and he knows your days. We are created in the image of God. In Genesis 2-7, we read a verse we've all read. And the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Psalm 103, 14 says it, For he knows we are formed, he remembers that we are dust. It's always been a verse I've accepted. But I've done some research on this. I want to show you something. Where's it gone, right? And this, this really amazed me. I hope you can all see this. Can you all see that? I got to move forward. Right. You got that? Right. So in dirt or dust, there are all these elements, calcium, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphate and potassium. Now those make up 99.1% of our body. All those chemicals are from the earth are in you and me. You got that? Also, 0.9% of our body is made up of cobalt, chlorine, chromium, copper and five more elements in very, very small amounts. In fact, there are only uh, uh, 20 atoms of cobalt in our body. Now, all this is from the earth. I have this picture of God doing this and mixing it and then creating man. So when the Bible says that God knows we are dust, we are dust. We are made from the earth. We are of the earth. We were created by God using the same chemicals and elements that are found in dirt. That blew me away. And despite all the advancements in science, man 
I never made a living cell. Only God can make a living cell. So, for our body to work, all these have to be in balance. And we all know that when we get ill, sometimes we have to take extra pills to bring it back again. But our body is just like the universe. It's so finely tuned and so beautiful that our creation is mind-blowing. So when you look at somebody, you'll see God. You know, God created you just like that. And you're unique. Your face, your hair, your amazing body is unique. Because God has created us. And it just saddens me that so many people uh, don't believe that anymore. There's um, some verse in, in, in Corinthians which says this, 1 Corinthians 15. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So it's written, the first man, Adam, became a living being, the last Adam, as Christ Jesus, a life-giving spirit. The spiritual did not come first, but the natural, and after that, the spiritual. The first man was of the dust of the earth, the second man is of heaven. As was the earthly man, so are those who are of the earth. And as in the heavenly man, so also are those who are of heaven. And just as we have borne the image of the earthly man, we shall also bore the image of the heavenly man. But my next sort of um, on identity is called adoption. So in, in 1 Corinthians 15, there is the earthly man created by God magnificently out of the dust of the earth, but it's also the heavenly man. The earthly man is our Adam, the heavenly man is our Lord Jesus Christ. So we go to adoption, which is a, a very, very important theme in the Bible. The fact we've been adopted into the family of God by the blood of Christ on the cross should change us completely. Oops. And our identity is part of that. Our identity is who we are in Christ. It defines us. Our understanding of Christ and the Holy Spirit in us will shape our character and identity. And if you are a Christian, which I presume most of you are, people should see that coming out of you. Your core character is not of earth, it's of heaven. Your core character is not of man, it's of Christ. Because we've been changed. We've been changed to be more like him every day that we live. Uh, Ephesians 1.4 For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance to his pleasure and will. There are other verses that say Galatians 4, you know, uh, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. In New Testament times, it was quite common to have adoptions in the Roman world. Roman rich men were very keen to make sure that their estate went on. And sometimes if the, the man didn't have a, a son or heir, he would adopt somebody either a, a, a close relation or even sometimes a slave in order that the estate will go on. And what would happen, they would draw up the legal papers which were irrevocable and as soon as the man died, that person became the son and heir. So if, if, you're, if you own an estate, a house or something, you want to pass it on to your children, etc. That only happens when you die, doesn't it? Yeah, mostly. I mean, some kids try and grab it before, but normally it's when you die that the estate goes on. So when Christ died for us, he gave us his estate. We become members of his family. We become partakers of his life and his will. 
Hebrews 9 said, in the case of a will, it is necessary to prove the death of the one who made it, because a will is only in force when somebody has died. It never takes effect while the one who is who made it is living. This is why even the first covenant was not put into effect without blood. Right, I'm going to draw you a simple chart to try and help you get this. And to me, it's just uh, good stuff. Right. I was... Um, so my mum and dad had five, five children. One, two, three, four, five. We've all had children since then, right? So, you know, I'm, I'm the middle. There's me, so I got married, and then we've had loads of children. <laughs> Whatever, right. Okay. So, this is our earthly family tree, is it not? And you can all draw one, like I've done that. Yes? Right. Now, my mum and dad weren't Christian, we didn't go to church, etc., etc. But one day, my elder brother, Ken. He met a lady called Dot, they got married, right? And Ken became a Christian. Right? Because of that, four out of five of us became a Christian. Because Ken told us about Jesus. And now, if that's me, because of that, Sally and some of the kids have become Christians. So we have a bloodline which is given to us because of adoption. You and I have been adopted by Christ. So no longer are we of the earth, we are of heaven. No longer are we dead in our sins, but we are alive in Christ. Why? Because when Jesus died on the cross, he did that, gave up his life, that meanwhile adopt us. There's a lovely verse that says, we were once were not a people, but now we are a people. Now we are a family. You look around this church today, all the people in here are your brothers and sisters in Christ. Why? Because we're adopted. And it's not a worth that we should boast. Somehow, through God's grace and love, Ken met God, and as I say, the rest is history. And no doubt on your family chart, you can say, so-and-so took me to church, I found Jesus, and now my family believe. Just a word of encouragement. I keep praying for my sister Bonnie in America, who is getting quite old now, she's not a Christian. So pray for those people in your family that are not on the bloodline of Christ. The adoption process is an incredible, it's a beautiful thing to understand. You know, um, you know, 1 Peter 2, see what great love the Father has lavished on us. That we should be called the children of God because that's who we are. We can cry, Abba, Father, to our Heavenly Father, the one that created the universe and created us, has now adopted us, that we might have an amazing life on this earth and an eternal life with him. So our, our identity it's very important to us. So many people today are mixed up. They're trying to find their identity in all sorts of things. But the whole truth is that when you find Jesus, when he finds you, your identity is secure. My, my final point, I'll call it facts versus feelings, right? The subtitle is Living in the, in the Reality of Your True Identity. It's okay me saying this. When you're back at work tomorrow and it hits a fan and life is tough and you get ill and everything else goes wrong, you can sometimes forget that you are a child of God. You can sometimes forget that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. See, 
we're not absent of feelings. You know, feelings are what we made of. God gave us emotions and feelings. He gave us all these things to, as part of our character. But sometimes feeling can rob us of our, our adoptive condition. In, in the depths of despair, sadness and worry, we can forget that we are a child of God. So I just want to, uh, as ever, um, draw it out. I just want to hopefully do it quite simply. So, so I'm going to put... Oh, hang on. Can you see that? Can you see that? No. Yeah, OK. So, so here, whoops, here is your life and my life as a person. And this is a fact, fact area, right? The truth. So you and I can choose to live in this space. The fact we are born again, the fact God loves us, the fact we are Christian, the fact that, that Jesus died for us, yes? Outside of that, we have feelings. And we have feelings here. Because sometimes, life can be so amazing that we, we, move, we move away from our fact and we start feeling OK and we don't need God anymore, I'm rich, I'll get everything I want, and somehow I stop going to church and, you know, blah, blah, you know, whatever, yeah. Other times, you go down here when life is really tough. Yes. You can't pay the mortgage or you're ill. And feelings can make you really low. Some of you may know that I've been quite rough lately with these sort of headaches. And I tell you, mate, they're pretty awful. But when I get really tough, I, I, I just thank God that I'm his son and that these will pass, and that everything will be OK. So, we can choose to live here or here, or live in the, in the truth of our lives, in the truth of the Gospel, in the truth of knowing Jesus. So, don't let the brokenness of this world impact your relationship with Christ. Feelings can rob us of our our, our adoptive condition, that in despite our feelings, despite our circumstances, we are the most, what's the word, blessed people on earth. I said before, 6% of the population of the UK about that know Jesus Christ as their saviour. 94% or so do not have this. They're not adopted. They don't realise creator God. Their identity is mixed up in all sorts of stuff. And yet we can draw our identity from Christ himself. And in moments of sadness or happiness, we can understand that. He chose us out of his abundant love. You know, we all know it for God so loved the world. He gave his only son. Whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. And the second verse, it says, Jesus came in the world not to condemn the world, but that, that, well, through him the world might be saved. We are heavenly. We are saints. You know, you know when Paul wrote his epistle to, to church, he didn't say, hello, you sinners, and get yourself sorted out, did he? He would often say to the saints of Ephesus or the saints of Galatia. So, so... Paul called a saint. You and I are saints now. Not like in some church, we have to die before we become a saint. So, Saint Gordon, how does that sound? Right? Because we are saints. So, we can choose where we live. And this is quite difficult to explain, right? It is far better to live in the truth as a saint and handle your sin as it comes along, yes? Than to live in your sin and forget you're a saint. Your identity is that you're a saint. That you are a child of God, born of the Spirit, 
Saint. Saint Graham, Saint Roger, Saint Sally, Saint Luke. Mm -hmm. And this should change you. This should give you a, a bit of a, a zing in your life. Because the circumstances will change. You will have ups and downs. But we are all saints. There's a lovely verse I found in James 5.13. If anyone's in trouble, let them pray. If anyone is happy, let them sing songs of praise. So God knows that we are in trouble sometimes, and sometimes he knows that. But I want to remind you this morning that you are a saint, that you have a red block around your name. No longer of the earth, dust of heaven. No longer Adam, now Christ. It's the best way to live. Do look at the facts when you're feeling a bit low. Do not let feeling destroy the truth in your life in Christ. Summary. How great is our God? Right from the creation of the universe, right down to the minutia of creating each of us in our mother's womb. He has adopted us into his family. No longer slaves, free. We have that red block around our name. Our identity is based on Jesus' image. The Bible says we have the image of Christ, image of God, image of Deo. Amazing. That you, you are God's pinnacle of his creation. He made everything else for you, for you and me. The earth, the universe, all these chemicals. He made it for you and for me. So wonderful is our God. One day, all this will come to pass and our amazing creator God will come back, sort the earth out, and say, come with me, because I've prepared a place for you. Why? Because you're my child. You're my adopted son or daughter. So don't have an identity crisis. Remember who you are in God, and that will bless you.